Hello everyone, my name is Gary Price. I'm a librarian and the editor and founder of Library Journal's Info Docket. Today I have the pleasure and honor of speaking with an old friend, somebody who's, uh, who I've known for close to 15, 16 years now. And if you look at the growth of the open access movement globally, uh, this person is one of the absolute leaders, if not the go-to person on the topic and very responsible for the growth that it's seen over the last couple of decades. I'm talking about Peter Suber and formerly Peter is the director of the Harvard, Harvard Office of Scholarly Communications, director of the Harvard Open Access Project, a senior researcher at the Berkman Center, a senior researcher at Spark, and a research professor of philosophy at Earlham College. Peter, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Gary. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. A lot of things are going on in the open access community today and moving forward. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about something practical. Let's start with some advice and some suggestions for our viewers, many of them who are librarians and involved in the information community. What can the individual librarian and, the li and a library as a whole do today to move open access forward? Now that's a good question. First, we have to remember that the, the actors in the best position to speed up open access are authors themselves. Uh, the reason, quickly, is that they're in a position to decide whether to submit their work to open access journals, whether to deposit in an open access repository, or how to dispose of their copyrights. So the short answer is librarians can help by persuading authors to make a good decision. But there are many ways that they can do that. They can launch and maintain an open access repository at their institution. They can help the institution adopt a good, effective open access policy. And by the way, librarians do this all the time, not just in this country, but around the world. Uh, they can uh, inform uh, faculty members or publishing researchers face-to-face -face in their one-on-one -on -one interactions with them. They can lobby Congress to adopt good open access legislation. Librarians, I would say, are the most effective single stakeholder group. As a group, they're better informed about open access and more motivated to uh, achieve it than any other group, including faculty and administrators, uh, administration. You mentioned a moment ago about authors, uh, by about having librarians help persuade authors. What are some, of, oh, with your experience, what are some of the key issues that authors don't understand, mm -hmm. and perhaps librarians don't understand? That this is one of these don't get me started questions. Uh, <laughs> first of all, it's a common misunderstanding that all open access is gold open access or open access published by journals. Uh, it's true that a very healthy fraction of open access is published in open access journals, but uh, most open access in most fields is not published in open access journals. It's published in conventional non-open access journals, but a copy of the peer-reviewed manuscript is deposited in an open access repository. In the jargon, we call that green open access. And many people simply overlook the existence of green, but it's bona fide open access, and it has some advantages. For example, it's compatible with publishing in a non-open access journal. So when faculty or publishing researchers of any kind are thinking about their open access options, they should remember both. If they can't find a good open access journal in their field, and there are many fields in which they might not, then they should just publish in the best conventional journal they can find and make sure that they deposit the open that the deposit the peer reviewed manuscript in an open access repository. In most cases, the burden is on them to do that. You know, journal publishers permit that at the author's initiative, but they don't do it for them. So the author has to remember to do it. Another common misunderstanding is that all or most open access journals charge what are called misleadingly called author fees or publication fees or article processing charges. Uh, that's just false. Uh, there's nothing even a little true about it. It's not true that all of them do it. It's not true that most of them do it. A minority of them do it. About 30% of them do it. So more often than not, an open access journal will charge no fee on the author's side at all. Uh, now, while 70% of them charge no fees, about 50% of all the articles published in open access journals are in the fee-based variety. But that still leaves about 50% you know, of the time when you might publish in an open access journal and face no fee. I think many authors uh, steer clear of open access journals thinking that they would have to pay a fee, and of course they don't want to do that. 
But that gets to another misunderstanding, that when an open access journal does charge a fee, that the fee must be paid by the author out of pocket. But that's not true either. Uh, most of the time, these fees are paid by some sponsor on behalf of the author, usually the author's funding agency or the author's employer. Uh, the best study to date shows that only about 12% of the time when journals charge fees, the fees are paid by the author out of pocket. Uh, if we could just clear up those three misunderstandings, uh, I think we'd see a lot more open access. Authors would be less afraid. If somebody would come back and, and say, well, what about the sustainability of the ones that don't charge fees, how would you respond to that? Uh, I'd say the experiment is still ongoing. Uh, it's hard to tell whether a journal is sustainable, but of the 10,000 plus peer-reviewed open access journals listed in the directory of open access journals, about 70% charge no fees. Uh, we don't know if they'll be around tomorrow, but the same goes for, for the journal that do charge fees, the same goes for subscription journals. Uh, there have been studies of journals that have failed, but I don't think there have been uh, studies of the uh, percentage of fee-based versus no-fee journals uh, that are financially healthy. Uh, I think, by the way, a good number of subscription journals are not financially healthy either. Uh, I think society journals are often either in the red or struggling to enter the black. And there are, just for the record, fee-based and no-fee open access journals that are for-profit and profitable. So in principle, both business models for open access journals can bring a revenue stream that covers the expenses and brings more. What would you say to publishers, or what can librarians say to publishers to get them, if they're not already thinking about open access? Uh, first of all, overcome one of those misunderstandings I mentioned earlier. Don't think that the only business model is to charge article processing fees. Uh, if you think that, uh, and you don't think your constituency uh, would be able to come up with the money, you'll back away from the option. This has happened very often in the humanities, where it's true that authors uh, are seldom funded compared to natural scientists and can't put their hands on the, that money. But it's only one business model. It's a minority business model. At the Open Access Directory, uh, I've created a list of known, uh, that is, attested business models for peer-reviewed open access journals. And so far, we have 15 with links to examples. And so first, I would point publishers to that list and say, just look at this. There's more than one option. Uh, some of them may not suit you. Some of them might. Uh, just take a closer look. Click through to some of the examples. See whether they're like you. See whether those journals are healthy. Uh, you might even know some of the people at some of those journals or publishing houses, and you can talk to them. Uh, but don't think there's only one or even two or even three possible business models. There are many. One of the most talked about issues in open access publishing relates to predatory publishing. While yeah. they're not one and the same, they're often grouped together. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on predata predatory publishing and what can be done to get these people off the radar, so to speak? Yeah. Uh, first of all, they do exist. Uh, but having acknowledged that, let me go back and point out one more misunderstanding. As you say, it's often thought that all open access journals are predatory, uh, or even that all predatory journals are open access, and neither one of those is true. But they do exist. They're scummy. Uh, they're deceptive. They're harmful. Uh, I want to warn authors against them. I want to warn readers against them. I commend everybody who's trying to warn authors and readers against them. Uh, but I also want to alert people to be careful and draw some distinctions. Uh, because some athletes take drugs doesn't mean all athletes take drugs. Because some, some cops are bad doesn't mean all cops are bad. Because some journals are dishonest uh, or very low in quality doesn't mean all journals are, or all journals of a certain category. Uh, be discriminatory. Uh, use your judgment. Uh, when you publish in a subscription journal, you don't assume it's high in quality or honest just because it charges money. Uh, we can't assume open access journals are dishonest or low in quality because they don't. Uh, they use peer review. They often use the same standards and the same people uh, as subscription journals. Uh, if you, whatever criterion you use for quality, open access journals at the top of the quality spectrum are as good as the uh, subscription journals at the top. If we use uh, impact, metric, uh, impact factors as a metric, which I don't like to do, but it's just handy for people, uh, as early as 2004, more than 10 years ago, we found open access journals in the top cohort of impact factors in every scientific discipline. And of course, that's only grown since then. So there are a lot of high quality open access journals, but it's a good question. 
how do we tell what which ones they are? Or if you're interested in open access uh, journals and you go looking at them and you find some that you've never heard of, how can you tell whether they're good or bad? Uh, there are a couple ways to do it, but the most effective one is also the most obvious. You would only consider a journal in your own field, first of all, and if you're a publishing scholar, you're some kind of expert. So read the darn articles. Uh, look at some sample issues. Uh, can you say that those articles are good? Are they good enough? Do you want to be in the company of them? Uh, look at the editors. Are they people that you, whose names you recognize? Are they eminent in their field? Uh, here, we have to introduce a little qualification. One uh, trick used by predatory journals is to list people as editors who are not really editors and who have noticed this and have protested and tried to get their names removed, but who have failed because the journals are scummy. Uh, but you still have the acid test of reading the articles. You can also network with your colleagues in the same field. Have them read some articles. What do you think of these? Uh, and then if you actually submit one to one of these journals, see how well, how adequately, how rigorously your piece was peer reviewed. Uh, if you think it was a once over lightly and they accept it, you can still withdraw. You don't have to publish with them just because they accepted your paper. Uh, so I would recommend those kinds of tests first. Secondly, uh, there's a well-known blacklist of predatory journals and a well-known whitelist of non-predatory journals. I would recommend using them both, understanding the differences between a blacklist and a whitelist. Uh, the blacklist is the Jeffrey Beale list. The whitelist is, uh, at least the best-known whitelist, is the Directory of Open Access Journals. Uh, one of the differences, apart from the black-white difference, is that the B list is essentially the judgment of one person, and the DOAJ list is the uh, collective judgment of editorial panels that are set up in different fields. Uh, personally, I would prefer to use a white list. Uh, the DOAJ has criteria for uh, re-indexing, or that is, uh, displaying a journal. Uh, when it adopted its new criteria to try to eliminate predatory journals, it made all the journals in its list reapply for inclusion right. uh, and only allows them in if they meet certain criteria. Uh, if you go and see something in the DOAJ today, you know it's met those criteria. Uh, now that's one level, that's one filter, but you should still look at the articles themselves and ask your colleagues in the same field what they think of them. Uh, one more test I like to use is whether the publisher is a member of OASPA, the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association. This is the called the Trade Association of Open Access Publishers. OASPA has a code of conduct for its members, and it takes the code of conduct very seriously. Sometimes it actually refuses admission, uh, membership, to a publisher that doesn't live up to the code, and sometimes it expels publishers who don't live up to the code. So I like to advise uh, scholars who are solicited by a journal that's not in OASPA. I will consider you when you join OASPA. And I can admit that many good publishers are not yet members of OASPA, but if you give this reply, if a lot of us give this reply, that's an incentive for them to join OASPA, and it sends the signal. Uh, it's hard for me to tell your quality uh, unless you've been scrutinized by a group like that, and it is an incentive to live up to the code of conduct. What can be done to help improve discovery of open access material, especially when it comes to metadata? And this is obviously this would be an area where libraries could be directly involved. Because in my work, I find that you know, while one repository might call something one thing, another repository calls it something else. Do you think there's it's time for a, a standardized control vocabulary for open access material, or the adoption of an already Use one. Do you mean uh, metadata vocabulary for different flavors of openness, or no? Just description, other... description of the articles themselves. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is searching, um, you know, the soda and pop issue, you know, I call it one thing, you call it something else. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are international issues here um, and language issues, uh, bringing like things together, so to speak. Yep. We see that with a lot of uh, aggregators now, and obviously the Library of Congress with the control vocabulary. Right. Is there a need for that in the open access world, or or again, not even creating a new one, but adopting one that's already out there, or at least for a specific area, specific discipline? Uh, I would say yes, but it's the same need that we face on the subscription side. I don't think open access changes the issue. Uh, I'm also pessimistic that any good standard vocabulary would be adopted 
widely enough, right. uh, we can fine tune the standard vocabulary and then we can urge everybody to make use of it. But we've done that. We are doing it. We've been doing it for a long time and you can see the incompleteness of the outcome. I think that's where we're going to stay with metadata for a long time. One advantage of open access material is that it's searchable in full text by intelligent search engines. So right. that complements metadata and it makes work more discoverable even if the metadata are incomplete. Uh, I don't want to settle for incomplete metadata, but if we admit that we'll probably have to settle with it, settle for it, then uh, we should also want full text searching from good search engines. And that's what we get. We don't have to pick our favorite search engine, but the more we make work open to all the competing search engines, the more discoverable it is. And that gives open access an advantage over conventional literature. Peter, when we chatted before we began the interview today, you talked about attending a meeting at the ALA Midwinter Conference a couple of days ago dealing with uh, funding and mandates and all of those related issues. Can you talk a little bit about that and some of your concerns on those topics? Sure. The topic of that session was how universities can comply with the roughly two dozen open access mandates coming down from federal agencies in the United States. Uh, I welcome these. I worked for them. But they will make life difficult for universities mostly because they differ from one another. If they were all identical, if they were all like the NIH policy, or all like any other single model, then we could gear up to comply with that model and just spread it across a number of agencies. But the Obama White House, which called for these policies, allowed them to differ. It urged the agencies to coordinate so they wouldn't differ very widely. Uh, I can't tell how much they have coordinated, but some of them differ fairly widely from some of the others. But they also fall in clusters. Some of them are very similar to uh, a cluster of others. But at a university like mine, where we do research in almost every field, uh, we will get funding from almost all these agencies. And we'll have to comply with roughly two dozen eight new agency policies, which differ from each other. So we're trying to minimize that headache and find ways to uh, comply or deposit once uh, and have and not worry about the details at the agency level. And by the way, th this problem is well known to the federal government. It wants a solution to this as well. Uh, we talked a little bit in the session, but also after the session, about software that could help solve this problem. And uh, I'm, con I'm talking with others about how we can build such software. Uh, the good news is it only has to be done once for the whole United States, uh, but it might even only have to be done once for the whole world if you can deposit work in one place uh, and tell it how your work was funded, uh, that is, which policies you have to comply with, then the tool should understand where it has to be deposited, under what circumstances, on what timetable, and so on. Uh, it should also be able to send back a copy to your own institutional repository. So here at Harvard, all of our faculty are bound by institutional open access policies, but also, when they're funded, by their funders' open access policy. We want them to be able to deposit once and comply with all relevant policies. That's a software problem. It may be a large software problem. We think it's not uh, insurmountable. In fact, we have a, a vision for how to do it in a way that's fairly minimal and robust. But the tool doesn't exist yet. Uh, there are similar tools uh, at different degrees of maturity around the world. We want to be interoperable with them. We don't want to solve it from scratch if others are already working on it. But we do need that in order to uh, help us comply and to help other universities comply. Is the open access awareness movement as a whole doing anything to find new users in the sense of people who will be moving into academia in the future? And is that something that might be, uh, that should be done? In other words, as somebody once said to me, in May and June, you're a high school student, and a couple months later, you're now, an, uh, you're now in the academy and you're using an academic library and so forth. Are, uh, is the open access movement actually reaching out to, or should they be reaching out perhaps to high school students to let them know that not only that uh, this is something that they can count on, it very likely might save, them, uh, might save them time to find new research, but also that this concept exists in the first place. I, I, and I, I only bring this up because when I talk to a lot of uh, high school librarians, you know, they're always asking for quote-unquote academic or peer-reviewed material. Here it is, it's free, 
and people like me and many others are always pointing them to it. But is this something that maybe the, uh, the, the open access movement as a whole should be doing? And that is finding new users before they actually need to be a user. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, let me approach it in layers. Uh, first, graduate students are about to become academics. And graduate students are being introduced to open access in many ways. Sometimes universities require that dissertations become open access. Sometimes they recommend or encourage it without requiring it. Uh, and very often, uh, graduate students simply discover open access on their own because they're wired, they're savvy, uh, and it's hot. So they notice it and they pay attention. And they tend to be more enthusiastic about it than senior faculty. Uh, sometimes they worry about what it will do for their career. Uh, but at least they're aware of it, they want it to happen, and uh, they tend to have a better understanding than many faculty. And then if you go down to the undergraduate level, uh, there is a group called the uh, Right to Research Coalition, which is specifically an undergraduate student-oriented open access advocacy group. And there's a lot that undergraduates are doing now and have been doing to advocate open access, to educate their uh, professors about open access, to work for open access policies at their universities, but also in, at the government, uh, and to educate their peers about open access. Uh, very often, you know, undergraduates assist one another in learning research techniques. And there's a, a library house at Harvard in which undergraduate students teach their peers about research techniques. And uh, I haven't done this yet, but I guess I don't mind saying it in public. I'm planning to reach out to them and try to get them to educate their peers about open access at the same time. Uh, partly uh, to solve the problem you mentioned. Even if they're not going to publish research themselves, they have to look up research as part of their role as a student. They should at least understand how to look for open access research. They should realize that it exists. Now at the high school level, I think the way most high school students will learn about open access, if they don't run into it spontaneously while surfing the web, uh, is through open educational resources or OER. And that's a growing movement as well. And obviously, it's kin to open access to research articles. But it might well be the case at a high school that students will have an expensive textbook in one field and a, an open access textbook in another field, because more and more teachers in more and more fields and more and more schools are adopting open educational resources. Uh, they are in districts where textbooks have to be approved by a committee or even by the state before they can be assigned in a public school. They are being approved. Uh, because there's no reason why they can't be as high in quality as traditional textbooks. Uh, and some of them are as high and are even better. Uh, so students are encountering them much more often than they did before. And it's easy to digress and say, what we're doing here with textbooks, uh, others are doing with research articles or with research monographs uh, or with courseware uh, or with software code. Uh, that is the same sort of uh, decision to make the result of all this hard work freely available to everybody who needs it uh, is taking place across the whole spectrum of research and education and even culture. We see it with uh, digital reproductions of paintings in museums. Uh, so we see it so many places that students uh, who are primed with an open textbook can then see the phenomenon uh, across the board. And I think if they go to college with that awareness and then go on to grad school with that awareness, they'll be among those who just expect that uh, important work will be online and digital and can well be free if only the authors uh, had made that decision at the start. And they might be among those who wonder why some authors don't make those decisions. Uh, I wrote in my book that I think generational change is on the side of open access and I still believe that. And even if high school students are not aware today or while they're in high school about open access, uh, they're still going to be the kinds of people who grew up with the internet and who expect all important work to be online and expect most online work to be free of charge because it can be, especially academic work where the authors are not directly compensated by the publisher. Where, where why, why and when did this, this passion, passion and interest and in all this hard work for about open access start? Do you still maintain the same enthusiasm for it that you always have? And you know, you've given a lot of your career to this movement. Are you satisfied with what you've done and where the open access movement is some 20 years or more into it that yeah. you've been involved in it? Uh, boy, there are a couple questions in there, and they're not short. <clears throat> it started for me when I was a professor of philosophy, a teaching and publishing professor of philosophy in the 
uh, internet and World Wide Web came along while I was employed as a professor. And I was publishing in the ordinary ways, but I also wanted to experiment with this new thing, the World Wide Web. And I looked for things that I could put into HTML, and the most natural things at hand were my own publications. So I began to do that. Uh, and I noticed, as soon as they went online, that I started to get feedback on them that I never got before from the print editions. And some of these publications were more than 10 years old. So there was plenty of time for people to find them, notice them, read them, uh, correspond with me, if anybody was going to do that. But the rate at which I was hearing from serious readers went way up as soon as these went online. And although I started to put these online as a way of playing with HTML, uh, it occurred to me as soon as I was getting this feedback that this was a serious medium for scholarship. And I began to look around to see which other academics were noticing that and what academics were doing to take advantage of this serious medium for scholarship. And as you know, eventually, lots of people noticed and lots of people started doing things to take advantage. But at that time, very few people were noticing and taking advantage of it. So I began writing about it. And that's roughly how I got into it. But it seemed to me then, and it seems to me now, that there is everything to gain and nothing to lose by making your work open. Uh, it's entirely beneficial. And working for open access uh, helps research and education. And helping research and education helps just about everything. Uh, I read recently uh, a quote by H.G. Wells, uh, history is a race between education and disaster. Uh, it sounds especially true in this age of climate change. But the more we can make research uh, accessible to people who need it, whether they're professional researchers or not, whether they're policymakers or uh, people who run nonprofits or students, uh, or doctors or patients, uh, the more good we can do. Uh, some publishers find it hard to adapt, and we might say they're, we're, we're harming them. But first of all, publishers are adapting. Uh, that's another story by itself, but uh, they can adapt. Uh, and then there are uh, startup publishers who are open access from birth, who completely benefit from this, and there's no harm. Uh, we benefit the authors of research, we benefit the readers of research, uh, we make it easier for everybody to find knowledge. Uh, to test knowledge claims against one another, to follow the debate about uncertain knowledge claims, and to use all of that to solve our problems. If we try to solve our problems without knowledge, then we're losing the race with disaster. Uh, but insofar as we can uh, share what we know with everybody who needs to know, uh, we're doing our best to uh, solve these problems. I think that's unambiguously good. 